feel overwhelmed. I do the prayers of God already. And I'm summing up with the worship, talking about the battle. Yeah. And last week, as a church, we were praying. And as Rich alluded to, oh, he's gone. We were on our knees, yeah, praying. In fact, some of us were fasting, some of you guys were fasting. Just as we considered our church and the future of the church. And Tim came up and he talked about the miracle, and I'm going to call it a miracle, okay, that happened for him. Because lately I have been overwhelmed and burdened by the amount of sickness, viruses that are going around, people that uh, are in dire straits because of finances through no fault of their own. I know some people are experiencing emotional trauma and the Lord had just, he's not burdened me with that, but he's put it on my heart. And then of course we have the sickness that seems to be prevalent in, in the government today. I'm sorry to say that, but it does seem like that, doesn't it? Okay, among those who have that earthly power. So, the Lord said to me, read Ephesians, so I did. And verse 12, Paul says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So where is our battle? The Bible's plainly telling us. It's with those powers and principalities, against the rulers of this world, the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. And for us, the devil uses these powers and principalities against us, and even more so as we step out in the Lord. So I say I'm going to rejoice because we are stepping out in the Lord today. We are stepping out as a church. And the devil is coming against us. We see the sickness. We see the things that's happening. Again, James says, James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And this is what we've been doing this week. So then to God. So what I want to do now is I want to take that bit further. Okay. And I want us, as I pray, to echo my words if you like. Okay. And take a stand against those principalities in the world. So I'm going to ask that if you're able, could you just stand physically? But I also want you to stand spiritually with me as I pray. So Lord, all this is in your name. We recognise that we can do nothing but from you, by ourselves. We can only do what you ask us to do. So Lord, in Jesus' name, we declare that as your people, in you, we are seated far above the principalities and powers in the heavens. We declare that as your people, in you, we are seated far above the devil and his minions on this earth. Lord, close us with your spiritual armor and instill in us the weapons to enable us to be on the front foot against the enemy who would seek to deceive us. Lord. Open our spiritual eyes to see the activities of these principalities. Let us always be ahead of their schemes. Lord, we ask you now to release fiery angels to remove every stumbling block and pave the way to our success over the enemy. We claim it. Lord, by your spirit, empower us to overcome every spiritual battle. We declare that every arrow of the kingdom of darkness targeted at us returns back to the sender. We subdue the powers of darkness, fighting our destinies in Jesus' name. We destroy now any oath or vow made secretly against your church. We release the fire of God to burn to ashes any evil book which contains the name of any of your chosen ones. We declare that as your people, we receive deliverance from all spirits of adversity and afflictions. We command the angels of the Lord to execute judgment on evil forces against our immediate families and our church families. 
We ask for our continual, your continuous vigilance and your protection in this. Lord, we invite the spirit of confusion and division to come upon the forces of the enemy. We cancel all curses made against us, known or unknown, or unknown to us, by the blood of Jesus. Lord, we cancel all enchantments and spells that are against either us personally or your church. Spirit of sleeplessness, mother of sickness, be bound in the name of Jesus. O oh Lord, give us power to face all the challenges of the enemy. Lord, we pray that we loose ourselves from the bondage of fear, knowing that victory is ours because you are with us. Let the blood of Jesus cleanse us from head to toe of every evil mark. Lord, make us a source of supernatural blessing to others so that they too can experience victory over these principalities and powers and turn to you for salvation. We declare today that we regain our crowns from the enemy and that they shall have no power over this church. Lord, again, we declare that you're sovereign over us and that we can do nothing without you. We humbly submit all these things to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Andy. Why we? It's so so thrilling, actually, to see so many people who were absent last week because of sickness back here, and that is so so encouraging. And so we just press on, and we continue to seek God to be a family together and to trust in His sovereign power to break into situations and circumstances that otherwise seem difficult if not impossible. So bless you guys, great to see you, thank you Andy. Uh, we are, as you may remember, in the middle of our series on Romans chapter 8, going through it bit by bit, uh, and uh, I've done a number of them, and it's about time that I stopped and gave <laughs> other people opportunity to preach, and so that is what's happening today. Uh, and uh, absolutely thrilled that Steve's going to come and share with us. Steve and Rebecca Painter have been with us uh, and such a blessing to Grace Church. Um, we're so, so thankful for them. Um, often they are just a around so early on Sundays, they help to set up. Uh, and Steve not only is a great preacher, but he's also a servant. Uh, at the end of the service, often you see Steve with a broom uh, just sweeping the floor of this place. And uh, who knew when he joined us that he'd end up uh, wielding a broom on a Sunday morning. But uh, we're so, so thankful for Steve and for Rebecca. And they're a great blessing to us. Uh, and he's going to come and bring God's word to us. So I wonder whether we could welcome him as a thank Steve. <laughs> Last time I, uh, I don't know, I don't know how to put them on. Uh, oh, it's a button. Okay. Uh, last time I was here uh, speaking to you, I used a chair because I have a poorly foot. I'm going to try and do this without sitting down, um, so I will give that a go. <laughs> right. Hang on the bell. Let's get this right. Ah, <laughs> uh, that's probably good. Thank you. Terry said, uh, we're going through Romans, and um, if you haven't had a chance to um, see the previous uh, talks at all, uh, it might be worthwhile uh, doing that. Um, and as a result, um, there were only eight verses to, to read through before we start what we're going to mention to you this morning, so I thought just a bit of context would be useful. So I'll just read the first eight verses, and then we'll get on to what Terry's asked me to talk about. So it's Romans, if you've got the Bible with you, it's Romans in chapter 8, and um, I'll just read through verses 
1 to 8, and then we'll get on to what we were going to do this morning. So verses 1 to 8. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So this morning then from verse 9 onwards, five verses, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Uh, let's just pray for a minute, shall we? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. Please help us this morning in not just understanding your word for the sake of head knowledge, but that it would become part of us and fill our lives so that we can be better people for your sake in front of everyone. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 Verses 9 to 13, which is what we're going to be doing this morning, has three neat little sections for us. 9 and 10 deal with some theological statements that Paul gives about the flesh, about the spirit, about believers and unbelievers. Verse 11 talks to us about the future promise that we have in Christ. And verses 12 and 13, Paul is describing a battle for holy living. So that's where we're going. However, just before we start and get into the detail of this, I want to ask you all a question. And if you know it, the answer, just shout out. Can you remember who was the oldest man in the Bible? Methuselah. Methuselah, fantastic. The more awkward question, which you might have to look this up, uh, is how old was he when he died? Oh, he was old, wasn't he? I'd love to have his pension, that's for sure. Um, it's in uh, Genesis chapter 5 and verse 27. Um, it says that Methuselah was 969 years old and then he died. Did he get that? Oh, well, don't you. <laughs> Well, have you got your Bible there, haven't you? Yeah. All right, on there. Okay, what I want you to do is to look up the age of Noah. That's a bit more tricky. But that was Genesis chapter 9 and verse 29. And whilst you're looking this up, I want to ask you all another question. Can you remember the name of Noah's three sons? Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Well done. 
Now, the, 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 the line of Jesus comes from which son? Can you remember? Shem. It's Shem. You know why it has to be Shem, dear? Because it wouldn't have been kosher coming from Ham. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. No, it was just giving Terry some time to look it up. It, it, it's chapter 9 and verse 29. Noah, it says, I'll help you out there, Terry. Okay. It says that Noah died after 950 years, only a shared under Methuselah. How about Adam? When did Adam die? How old was he when he died? Well, you have to look it up, okay? And if you're going to look it up, it's in Genesis chapter 5, verse 5. And it turns around and says, Adam lived until he was 930 years old. Wow. Actually, if I said to you, how old was Adam when he died? It's a bit of a trick question. Because Adam actually died twice. When you read Genesis chapter 2 and verse 17, this is what it says. But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, this is a common point that critics make about the Bible. They turn around and say, well, surely there's some contradiction here. It turns around and says, how can Noah live till 930 years and then in the day that you eat the fruit, you shall surely die? You can't have it both ways, they say. Now, there is a point at which we must answer this. Well, if you look at the Hebrew in detail, the verse where it says uh, in 217, chapter 217, it says, dying, thou shalt die. Noah died spiritually when he ate the fruit. Sorry, yeah, Adam died spiritually when he ate the fruit. And he then eventually died physically 930 years later. Now the consequence of Adam's disobedience was separation from God and obviously physical death. Now try and follow me with this. I hope I get this right, so. Up to that point, Adam and Eve had, well, not got it together as it were, okay? They didn't have any children before that point. And so, every child that was conceived from that point and born from that point, were born separated from God and eventually will die. Cain, their firstborn, was born in separation from God and 730 years later experienced physical death. Likewise, we are all born in separation from God and from our first breath. We are dominated and controlled by this sinful, rebellious nature which the Bible sometimes calls the flesh. And it's this flesh which places us under the condemnation of God. I say again, every one of us at some point in our past we're conducting ourselves in accordance with the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and by nature we were wrath, in wrath of, of the wrath of God and enemies of God under his wrath. How on earth can this be put right? Well, sin has its price. And the price of sin is death, and Jesus had to die to pay for it. So then is that it? Do we look back to the cross now and say everything is changed now? The price of sin has been paid for because Jesus died and the whole of mankind is now in a completely different relationship with God and everything is wiped clean. The slate is clean. There is a brand new relationship for everyone. Well, the answer is no. Let me remind you in verse 9. From the, the passage just now. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, the last four words, he is not his. Let me just concentrate on this last part for a second. 
Paul is making it plain that by explaining that the world has only two groups of people, he is saying there are those who are his, and there are those who are not. There are those who are in Christ, and there are those who are not. There's no middle ground. There's no nice group of people who put down C O V on a form because they have to, and then never see them in church. There's no group like that. They're either in Christ or they're not. Now you're all familiar with John 3.16, but let me read to you John 3.18. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You see, there it is again. You're either in one place or you're in the other. You're either under condemnation or you're not. Well, let me move on. Notice again in verse 9 how the Apostle explains our sinful nature, the flesh, and the spirit are at opposition. They're in conflict with each other. But you are not in the flesh, he says. But you are in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. And again in verse 10. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. There's an opposition in that explanation. Now I want to take a quick poll here. I'm not going to ask you anything embarrassing, but it does include me, so I'm going to put my hand up. Okay. <laughs> Hands up, all of those of you who are approximately 25 years and older. <laughs> that covers probably a good portion of us, okay? Unfortunately, I've got some bad news. The bad news is this, is that scientists tell us that when you're about 25, that's it, okay, when you're about 25, the cells in your body are dying faster than the cells in your body can regenerate them. <laughs> so if you are over 25 this morning, whether you like it or not, you are in the process of decay. <laughs> And with the greatest of respect to you ladies, and I love you all, all that the cosmetic companies can do is to sell you embalming fluid. Okay? That is all they can do. But look, it's not all bad news. Because what the cosmetic companies can't do, God will put right when we get resurrected from the dead. Okay? Verse 11, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Hallelujah. Now here quite probably is one of the greatest and clearest descriptions and promises that we've got in the Bible. For those who are in Christ, that is. Because the Holy Spirit lives in you, you're promised a resurrection body. I can't wait. <laughs> we are all going to be raised from the dead. Now, Paul talks about the resurrection in many different ways in the Bible, okay? Take, for instance, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he talks about the order in which people are going to be raised. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he talks about how visible and how noisy it's going to be. There's going to be archangels involved. There's going to be trumpets involved. There's going to be the voice of God involved. Look, I don't know how many um, uh, alarm calls you use in the morning to get up, right? <laughs> but, I mean, Rebecca and I, we use our phones to wake up. Rebecca uses it three times. One, two, wake up. Another one to say, right, you've only got five minutes, and another one to say, right, you better get up and go for the shower. You know, there's three, uh, did you ever know that there was three alarm calls for waking the dead? Did you ever know that? Excuse me a minute. <laughs> I'll just read to you a couple of verses from uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 
There's four T's in a row in your Bible. Did you know that? There's Timothy, Timothy, Thessalonians, Thessalonians, and Titus. Four T's in a row. Just put it easy for to remember it. Um, and it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. First alarm call. With the voice of the archangel. Second one. And with the trumpet of God. There's three alarm calls. So by the time that they do all that, you'll be up, all right? <laughs> So it's all noisy and it's going to be all so exciting, which, again, I can't wait for. <laughs> Here, in our passage, however, what Paul is doing is making the information about the resurrection of the body far more personal. What he says is this, But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, Paul is reflecting on the Holy Spirit raising Christ from the dead. And if you've got that spirit this morning, he is going to raise you. That's what he's saying. Secondly, notice please in verse 11, how many pronouns are used? But the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit. There it is, him. He, his, lots of pronouns, but it's important that we realize actually who it's talking about. Now I know that you won't find the word Trinity in the Bible, but in that verse, it's all the way through it. You can't miss it. One great preacher turns around about the resurrection and says, God the Father planned it. Jesus executes it because he says in, in the John's Gospel chapter 6 he says I will raise them up on the last day Jesus is involved in our resurrection and the Holy Spirit applies it it will be ours too Amen. now when the verse says he will also give life to your mortal bodies I don't want you leaving this morning thinking that our resurrected bodies is just what we've got patched up a bit <laughs> it's not like that at all <laughs> uh, let me just read to you a passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and this is from the Living Bible it's just really easy to follow through it says this for we know that when this tent we live in now is taken down when we die and leave these bodies we will have a wonderful new body in heaven and I can't wait homes that will be ours forevermore made for us by God himself and not by human hands. How weary, Paul writes, how weary we grow in our present bodies, my goodness. <laughs> that is why we look forward eagerly to the day when we shall have heavenly bodies, that we shall put on like new clothes. I, I am confident, I've got so many concerns, but leaky heart valves and goodness knows what, but I just can't wait for it. For, he says, we shall not be merely spirits without bodies. These earthly bodies make us groan and sigh. But we wouldn't like to think of dying and having no bodies at all, says Paul. We want to slip into our new bodies so that these dying bodies, as it were, would be swallowed up by everlasting life. And here's the connection between what he's written in uh, Corinthians and what he writes in Romans. He turns around and says, this is what God has prepared for us. As a guarantee, he's given us the Spirit. Amen. My friends, our resurrected bodies are going to be glorious. Amen. Imperishable. No eternal. Uh, no <laughs> spiritual and immortal. And all done in a twinkling of an eye. Hallelujah. What a promise that we've got to look forward to. Well, we need to go on to the last few verses for today. And these are equally important. In verses 9 and 10, we saw the theological statement. In verse 11, we saw that great promise that we've got a future ahead. Verses 12 and 13, Paul deals with the problem of the living now. We've got something to look forward to, we've got our position right, but how do we cope now? And this is what he does in verses 12 and 13. He says, therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, 
you will live. Now, at the beginning, I, you remember I started talking to you about Adam and Adam's disobedience and that the consequences of it were separation from God and finally physical death. So in verse 12 here, Paul is reiterating that very point. He's turning around saying, look, if by following the sinful nature it results in physical death, why do you think you owe it anything? You don't. If by following the flesh it causes eternal separation and condemnation from God, why, oh why, Christian people, do we give it house room at all? We shouldn't be living under the flesh. The Apostle Paul is a realist. He doesn't give us a bunch of theology and says, oh no, go and work it out on your own. You know, as, as if you're a, some person on a desert island on your own and just left to it. No, he doesn't do that at all. He turns around and says that the Holy Spirit that lives in you will help you live this life. But you know, he bursts, he says, you put to death the sinful nature. You do it. We've got a responsibility. And you know, we've got a responsibility to live in front of three different people. One is ourselves. The darkness, the Bible says, is as light to God. There's nothing hidden. He knows all our secrets. I remember Terry telling us one time, he says, you know, you're all right to be good in company. But when you're on your own in private, that God is interested in how you live too. Secondly, we are responsible about the way we live in front of God. You know, you remember on the cross where Jesus turns around and says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you know, God isn't apathetic about sin. He hates it. He hates it. And he hates it so much that Jesus had to die to pay for it. And do you know what? If he hates it that much, so do should we. We shouldn't want to live it. Thirdly, we also have a responsibility to live in front of others. They will watch you like a hawk. And the first trip that you make, they will say to you, you are just like me. No, we've got a responsibility in front of others. Because how on earth are we going to get others to come to faith if we are not if we live the same way we should be living as clean as possible but it's not all bad news we are not abandoned god gives us the spirit to help us he the holy spirit dwells in each and every one of us if we are in christ and are his and he is there to direct you. He is there to guide you. He is there to teach you. He is there to help you pray. He is there to help you praise. He is there to help you serve. He is there to comfort you when you need it. And to fill you when you need it. And give you gifts and fruit and all those wonderful things that he will do. Praise God. Finally in verse 13. We are encouraged to do one last thing against the flesh and that is to commit murder we are to kill the flesh remember what jesus said if anybody wants to follow me he must take up his cross and deny himself and follow me we've got to crucify the flesh in us it's our problem to deal with with the holy spirit's help the fight to live a holy life before God and that drive to try and do it correctly is technically called sanctification okay and God turns around and says I am going to help how does he help us well with this I'll finish you know recently at work we had um, a fire brief we get them every year and we were reminded about the fact that, where's Ruben? Is Ruben here? Yeah. Oh, Ruben, you'll say this. Uh, look, one of the things that you'll do when you're trying to put a fire out is chuck water at it. But another thing you can do with a fire is to starve it of oxygen. And if you starve it of oxygen, you can't go on. Can I suggest that one thing we can do to fight against the flesh is to starve it? 
we've got to be careful about what we watch, what we listen to, what we hear. We don't join in with other things that we shouldn't. This is what I mean, to starve it instead. Another thing is to remember that we are not on our own. The Holy Spirit will help us and take us away from those things when we starve it. I love my house. My wife puts, Rebecca, she puts on music, or UCB1 or whatever it is, is that right? Yeah, okay. Now don't get me wrong, I, some of the songs I, I know. But, but my house is filled with worship. The whole house has got a wonderful atmosphere because it's filled with worship all the time. I like secular music, right? I, I, I must admit, you know. But the house has got a nice atmosphere. And I wouldn't put that, stop that at all ever. It's great. Because it helps us think the right way. Even though you might not realize it, things are going in all the time. And finally, just remember this morning that actually because of the Holy Spirit that you are living inside, you have got a future. We got, we've got something to live by. The Holy Spirit living in us. We've got our, uh, our uh, position in Christ. And we've got a future coming. Right. Let's pray for a second. Shall we? Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for your glory, your wisdom, and your, your perfect way of, 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 that we can be guided in by the power of your Spirit. Help us, Lord, in this life to live rightly before you, when we're on our own and before others. And help us remember that we have a future and that one day Jesus is coming back. And if you want to know when, <laughs> no, I was telling Rich, I said to him, I have found out when Jesus is coming back. Now, you don't think I've gone mad, right? Because you know in chapter 24 of Matthew's Gospel, it says, Nobody knows the day or the hour when the Son of Man will come, but I found out which day it is. <laughs> There's a challenge. Because Jesus turns around and says, I will, and this is a cop out, but Jesus turns around and says, I will raise him up on the last day. <laughs> so it's on the last day that he's going to turn up. And I will tell you when that is. That's on February the 6th. Now then, there's a chance. Why February the 6th? Because it's my birthday on February the 6th. <laughs> but to be quite honest with you, when Jesus returns, and we all get raised from the dead, unless you're alive at that point, I don't think we will be fine. Right? Uh, but unless we all get raised from the dead, then it will be everybody's birthday when we get 